Good morning, and welcome to the academic symposium honoring the inauguration of the 11th president of Wayne State University, Alan Gilmore. Uh, we are so pleased, uh, President Gilmore, that you're here. I also want to acknowledge a member of our Board of Governors, Paul Masseron. So we're here this morning to showcase and celebrate some of the remarkable accomplishments of our faculty. At Wayne State, we create knowledge here every day through research, by challenging ideas, and by nurturing a process of creativity. Often we think of the incredible work that takes place every day in laboratories across this campus. And as impressive as that work is, people are also hard at work in the social sciences, the arts, and the humanities. So today we're going to present a wonderful cross-section of award-winning, nationally and internationally recognized faculty. We'll hear from doctors and engineers and chemists and mathematicians but we're also going to hear from musicians and actors and poets, and all of them doing their groundbreaking work here in Midtown Detroit. This is what makes us unique. This is Wayne State University. Some of our presentations this morning will be live and in person, and some will be on video. But regardless of how they're delivered, they illustrate the amazing resource of academic talent that we have here at Wayne State. And speaking of amazing resources, uh, I would like to introduce our panel of scholars who, in the true spirit of a symposium, will help facilitate a discussion uh, about the presentations at the conclusion of each half of this morning's event. Uh, affectionately referred to around here uh, as the three tenors, although I'm told we're not paying them enough to sing today. So um, I would uh, like to introduce first the Dean of the Irvin D. Reed Honors College, a professor of English and American Studies, author of two acclaimed books and many critical articles in journals such as the South Atlantic Quarterly, Antioch Review, and Harper's, recipient of the Board of Governors Distinguished Faculty Fellowship and the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching, and by the way, a great boss, <laughs> Jerry Heron. Also, distinguished professor of obstet obstetrics and gynecology, the J.M. Malone Jr. MD Endowed Chair, and director of the C.S. Mott Center for Human Growth and Development, Robert Sokol. And last but certainly not least, Associate Chair of Computer Science and the President of our Academic Senate, Seymour Wolfson. Our first presenter today is Dr. Roberto Romero. He is Professor of Molecular Obstetrics and Genetics. He is Chief of the Perinatology Research Branch. He is Program Director for Prenatal Research and Obstetrics in the Division of Intramural Research of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, part of the NIH. He has authored more than 700 peer-reviewed publications and several books. Dr. Romero is recognized nationally and internationally. He is a member of the Wayne State University Academy of Scholars. Presenting Breakthrough Treatment Reduces Preterm Births, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Roberto Romero.
Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations, President Gilmore. Um, the talk that I have today is a, chap is a talk in three chapters, and is entitled The Child is the Father of the Man. And I want to begin by telling you that Wayne State University is one of the only universities actually in this country that houses an intramural program of NIH, the Perinatology Research Branch. So on to chapter one. The first concept is that insults that are sustained during fetal life predispose to adult disease in the form of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, schizophrenia, and even allergies. And I want to link these insults and show you an example of the work done at Wayne State University. The key concept is that adult diseases are the price pay for in utero adaptation to environmental insults. So here we have a baby that looks normal, normal head, eyes open, but if you look carefully, this is the iliac crest, and this is the popliteal fossa, indicating that this baby has had intrauterine gross starvation. What is the price that we pay for that? Well, the short-term price is to reduce the baby size. But is there any long-term price? Well, this is work done by David Barker, an epidemiologist in the United Kingdom, that look at the risk of premature de death less than 65 years of age from cardiovascular disease according to birth weight. And this was a detective story, but the data is clear. Babies born with a weight of less than 2,500 grams who were born at term had an increased risk of dying from cardiovascular disease at the age of 65 or less. Why may be made this be the case? This is a fetus connected with placenta. This is a fetal heart. And this is a cross-section of the placenta. So this is maternal blood. Over here, every one of those purple asterisks means that these are fetal vessels and there is exchange of nutrients and oxygen from the maternal blood into the fetal circulation. Now imagine that this placenta has become sick and as a consequence, I have represented this placenta as having been squeezed by a blood pressure cuff. The resistance in the uterus is increased. This is how that placenta will look like. The intervillous space will be very wide. A divili, which is the lung of the fetus, now looks diseased compared to this one. Rarely, they are vessels, and the ones that you see are thrombos, an abnormal placenta. Now, this is a fetal heart. This is the aorta, and these are the two arteries that all of us have perfusing our heart. A heart attack is fundamentally an obstruction of these vessels. So I'm going to show you this picture taken at Wayne State University at the Detroit Medical Center of a baby who was intrauterine growth restricted. This is the fetal heart. This is the chest, the amniotic fluid. This is the aorta. And this is a vessel that we normally do not see. This is a fetal coronary artery that has been dilated. There's nothing like action. So here, you have a cross-section of the aorta and two jets, the coronary arteries widely dilated in a human fetus. So the question is, can a human fetus have a heart attack? Babies are born all the time. They cry, but they can't talk. They can't tell that they have chest pain. So do babies who are born small and are at risk for having a heart attack before the age of 65 suffered this insult in utero. Well, this is the study that we did at Wayne State University. We examined troponin I, the enzyme that is measured in each one of us if we go to the emergency room with chest pain. And we measure in babies who were of appropriate weight for gestational age and babies who were small for gestational age. 4% of all babies who were small and everything else was fine, they were born at term, 
had evidence of myocardial injury at the time of birth. So this is evidence that the fetus can sustain a heart attack in utero, that this is an event that is silent, and if we don't discover it, it may, see, may create the seeds for adult disease. And the same can be said for obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and many other disorders that I will not discuss with you today. But one example, that prevention of disease may need to begin in utero, a paradigm for the 21st century. The chapter two is something that we discussed last week. This is a premature baby. It's a major challenge to modern obstetrics, the leading cause of perinatal morbidity and mortality worldwide. There are 13 million premature babies born worldwide, 11 million in Africa and in Asia, in the United States, 500,000 every year. This disease cost $26.2 billion per year in medical costs, educational costs, and loss of productivity. Premature birth is caused by many causes. To highlight two, cervical disease of the uterus over here and a deficiency in progesterone. This is a progesterone, a natural hormone whose function progesterone is to maintain pregnancy. And two things that progesterone do is to maintain the cervix long and close during pregnancy. And the second is to keep the uterine muscle quiescent prior to the onset of labor. So here, a normal pregnant woman with a long cervix, and here, a pregnant woman with a short cervix. She is at an increased risk for having a preterm delivery. And the question is, can preterm birth be prevented in women with a short cervix in the mid trimester, giving them a simple intervention vaginal progesterone? We and others participated in this large multinational study that was led here from Wayne State University, the pregnant trial, that included 44 centers worldwide from all continents, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And the patients were singleton gestations, mothers between 19 and 23 weeks, who had a short cervix, and they were randomly allocated to receive a vaginal cream, self-administered vaginal progesterone, or placebo. And these are the results. There was a 45% reduction in the rate of preterm birth at less than 33 weeks of gestation. There was a 50% reduction in the rate of preterm birth at less than 28 weeks. This is important because this is the leading cause of infant mortality worldwide. The rate of premature babies in Detroit is close 17%, which is substantially higher than the national average. We also reduce the rate of preterm birth at less than 35 weeks of gestation. But that is not enough. We need to reduce infant morbidity. And here is evidence from our trial that respiratory distress syndrome, the most common complication of premature birth, was reduced by 61%. So in summary, a simple administration of vaginal progesterone in women with a short cervix led to a substantial reduction in the rate of preterm birth at less than 28, 33, and 35 weeks, decreased the rate of respiratory distress syndrome, there was no increase in the evidence of adverse events and no safety signal. So now we're poised to launch a national and international program to screen women for preterm birth and a simple intervention at hand. The last chapter. There is a relationship between being born too early and cerebral palsy. And this is a child with cerebral palsy. That child cannot walk. You can see the motor disorder, has difficulties in posture. And this is another child with cerebral palsy that has a spastic disorder. You can see the hands and the lower extremities. Often, but not always, associated with cognitive disorders. Well, over the last 10 years, much of this work done at Wayne State University, we have determined that all women have microorganisms in the lower genital tract. For reasons that are unclear, we have begun to decipher these microorganisms may gain access to the uterus. 
go into the amniotic cavity and invade the human fetus. And when they do that, the human fetus mounts a systemic inflammatory response that, among other things, can lead to this condition, the fetal inflammatory response syndrome, described by Wayne State University, and injures the fetal brain. And this is the seed for cerebral palsy in at least 22% of all cases. So the question is, can the fetus with brain involvement be identified in utero? And can we do anything about it? So the first step is, can we develop an animal model of cerebral palsy? This work done in the laboratories of Wayne State. We chose a New Zealand white pregnant rabbits, randomized to saline, a microbial product, lipopolysaccharide of endotoxin, that did not put the animals into labor. They delivered at term, but we have controlled babies and babies that were born with endotoxin. And this is what happened with the normal babies. A rabbit at day one of life. And this is how rabbits normally walk. And this is a baby exposed to endotoxin the lowest dose of endotoxin. And you can see the dramatic difference. But this is the first animal model of cerebral palsy. The next question is, is there anything that we can do to identify the baby that has neuroinflammation? And is there anything that we can do to prevent this disease? So with the group at Children's Hospital, we look at microglia. These are small cells that are in the central nervous system that became activated when there is inflammation and express a particular receptor. And Henry Shagani and his group developed a particular probe to identify microglia activation at the time of birth. And here you have animals that have been exposed to saline. There is no activation, no difference in the color. But here is a baby that has been exposed to the endotoxin in utero, and you see a dramatic difference in the color, meaning there is activation of that microglia cell that causes inflammation. Can injury, can, is there anything that we can do? Or do we need to accept that cerebral palsy is inevitable? Well, this is a collaboration between the School of Medicine, the Perinatology Research Branch, and the Calling of Engineering. The investigators are the canons from the Department of Pediatrics and the College of Engineering. And I'd like to introduce you to dendromeres that are tree-like polymers. These are nano-platforms with their size. And these are dendromeres, and at scale, this is the size of a dendromere. Now what we can do is to couple anti-inflammatory agents to these dendromeres and see if we can deliver them to the site of inflammation. So that is exactly what we did. We coupled N-acetylcysteine to the dendromere and rather than giving them directly into the brain, we gave them to animals who had this motor disorder. And a few things happened. First, here is the dendromere. Here is how we couple N-acetylcysteine. We found that in the dendromeres can be internalized by the cell. Then they can release their cargo into the cell, an anti-inflammatory agent and then the dendromere is expelled. The next step is to give them to animals in the first day of life. Here is the brain, the lateral ventricle. In the control animals, you see nothing. But in the animals who have inflammation, you see the dendromeres precisely in the area of inflammation. All of this is good and fine, but the question is, can we make any difference? So here is one experiment. This is a baby rabbit, day one of life, that is working just fine. This is a baby that has been exposed to endotoxin, day one of life, dramatic problem walking. And this is an animal that has been given the dendromere with N-acetylcysteine on day one of life, a few hours. No difference, they are little mates, these two. Now, let's see what happened five days later. This one is a control animal, a little larger, walking 
very well. This one is the animal exposed to the endotoxin, treated with saline, has difficulties walking. Nothing has changed. And this is a slitter mate treated with dendromeres with n cysteine. And you can see a dramatic difference between this and this. And this animal behaves closer to the control. It was walking so much that it was going to escape the cage. Now, we don't want to claim that this is a cure for cerebral palsy. But I think that this is evidence that there is a window of opportunity, that we are not condemned to have cerebral palsy, and that we can identify at the time of birth with molecular technique who is affected. And there is an intervention that can be administered intravenously that goes to the brain. And there is a window of opportunity to prevent what has been a chronic disease costing more than $5 million a year, billion dollars would it be. All of these three stories perform here in the laboratories and with the patients from downtown Detroit and at Wayne State University. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, amazing presentation. Next, uh, we want to introduce you to the One Minute Scholar. Some of you may have seen uh, these great videos. Um, they are a wonderful way to connect uh, to young people about the kinds of things that go on at an institution like Wayne State and the caliber of faculty that we have here. Uh, keep in mind that these were produced for 14, 15 year olds. Uh, some of us may be a few years away from that, but um, they're fun, they're fast, and the first one we're going to see involves explaining what happens when you put mints into a bottle of Diet Coke. Um, and you're all going to want to try this when you get home tonight, I assure you. Um, and to explain it is Dr. Matthew Allen. Dr. Matthew Allen is Assistant Professor of Chemistry. He has earned a National Science Foundation Career Award, a Theme Chemistry Journal Award, um, a College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Teaching Award, and his research is focused in chemistry of magnetic uh, MRI imaging uh, and asymmetric uh, catalysts. He is featured in the one minute video and then we're going to have him live and in person to talk to us about some other amazing things that take place in the chemistry department here at Wayne State. One Minute Scholar. So I'm online and I come across these videos of people putting candy in diet soda. So I was like, wow, look at these explosions. I call my mom and I'm like, mom, you gotta go on the internet and check these videos out. She's like, internet, Tony, go study. I was like, all right, whatever, fine. So I call Dr. Matt Allen, a chemistry professor at Wayne State University, and he's gonna show us why this happens. Dan, pull. Wow. Okay, so you have your two liter of soda. That two liter has lots of dissolved gas in it. The gas is carbon dioxide. What happens is the candy causes all the carbon dioxide to come out of solution very rapidly. So what's causing that with the candy is if we had a picture of a candy here, it looks very smooth. If we zoom in on the surface, the surface looks very, very rough. This rough surface acts like a catalyst to bring dissolved gas out of solution, and it forms these large bubbles that come to the surface very rapidly. Pretty sweet, huh? Just like soda and candy. And if you think that's pretty sweet, you should check out what else we do at Wayne State. I had the task of summarizing chemistry. Well, I'll stand next to the mic. I was just loading this up. Summarizing the chemistry department in, in five minutes, and that's 
what is a pretty daunting task. And so I thought, what might an audience of non-chemists like to hear about the chemistry department in five minutes? And, and so I started thinking about when, when my wife and I meet non-chemists, and, and they turn to her and they say, well, what do you do? And she says, I'm a veterinarian. And they say, oh, that's fascinating. Can you tell me about that? And then they turn to me and, what do you do? And I said, I'm a chemistry professor. And, and they say, oh, I, you know, I, I think I'm going to go get a drink. And, and so <laughs> what I take that to mean is that people really like animals and cocktails. And I thought that is where I would start the talk um, with uh, Dr. Matthews in the chemistry department. Um, so here's a picture of a, a mouse drinking a cosmopolitan. Um, she doesn't actually feed her mice cosmopolitans, but she does um, study the effect of ethanol on neuro signaling inside of brains. And that has implications in addiction and, and alcoholism. And, and her work is funded by the National um, Institutes of Health. And what happens is she feeds the mice alcohol and then looks at this neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain. And, and she does this using analytical chemistry techniques. So she's developing techniques to study this and then study these functions. Um, she uses electrodes in the brain, either in brain slices or inside of the live mice, and then gets basically um, data that looks like this on the right, which is some sort of a, you can think of it like a weather map, right? So where there's a, a big green circle, that's like a storm of dopamine signaling going around inside the brain. Um, and so now if these mice were to drink too much alcohol, I guess they would have an increased risk of cancer. And so that leads me into the next talk that I'm going to talk about here. Peter Andriana's lab, they're looking at making vaccines against cancer. So here I've got two circles that represent cells, one being a uh, normal cell, that's the one in black, one being a tumor cell, that's red for bad. And, and the surface of these cells, they're, they're littered with proteins and sugars, um, and, and they're very different from each other. And so the idea here is to vaccinate against the tumor by taking a piece of the surface of the tumor and exposing the, an organism to that, and then it would produce antibodies. So when the tumor showed up, it would basically attack the tumor like it was something foreign. And, and so Peter's lab is using chemistry to make these carbohydrates, so big sugar molecules. And the, the sugar molecule in red is something that's found on, on the tumor cell. Now, what Peter's lab is doing is using uh, these sugars that he makes on a large scale. Now, if he wanted to see what happened when one sugar reacted with one antibody, Right, he could collaborate with David Rueda in the chemistry department, who's doing single molecule spectroscopy. And so what the Rueda lab is doing is, is putting molecules, um, nucleic acids or proteins, on, on the surface of a, of a chip or a microscope slide. And then they shine a laser here. So that's the, the green part. This is a picture of his laser. Um, and he gets images like this movie on the right. And, and so what you're looking at in this movie are single molecules. So each dot is one molecule that's interacting with something else. And so the red flickering back and forth to green is another molecule interacting with that molecule. And if, if you're red, green, colorblind, I apologize. And you'll have to take my word that some of them are flickering back and forth. Um, and so right, here's my next transition. This was a stretch. If, you, if you're thinking these lasers take a lot of energy, there's people in the department that are also doing energy research. Um, there's a collaboration between the Varani lab, the Endicott lab, and the Schlegel lab. Um, that's sponsored by the Department of Energy, trying to store sunlight in chemical bonds, uh, and in particular, hydrogen and oxygen. And, and so the, the idea here is that you would use elements from the periodic table, manganese in green, ruthenium, Ru in blue, and cobalt, CO in pink, and then there would be water attached, right? The idea is when the sunlight shines, that forces electrons to move from the ruthenium to the cobalt, electron being just a very small part of an atom. Um, and then that sort of triggers a chain event. So manganese then puts electrons onto ruthenium. That pulls off electrons from the water. And now you end up with hydrogen and oxygen. Right? This is a sort of a cartoon. Um, and so what they're doing is using chemistry to make molecules that um, actually cause this to happen, or they're trying to cause this to happen. And, and so this is one of the, the structures that they're trying to make. And even if you, know, you, you don't really care about chemistry, or even if you don't care about imaging, or, or sorry, not imaging, but energy, um, you can at least appreciate that this is a very beautiful molecule. It's gigantic. It's, it's <laughs> symmetric, right? Um, and so, you know, where these elements are in the periodic table, so that's sort of our, our recipe book for, for chemistry, they're the green, the blue, and, and the pink towards at the, at the top of the table there. Um, and this is the transition into my slide. Uh, so my lab is interested in the lanthanides, colored in, in Wayne State green at the bottom. Um, there's lots of very interesting magnetic and optical properties 
that the lanthanides have. And two areas where, where my lab is, is interested in is contrast agents for magnetic resonance imaging. So we use the magnetic properties of the lanthanides to try and do things like diagnose tumors at an early stage or diagnose diseases. Um, or, and so the, the pictures on the left are, are MRI scans of, of brains. Um, and so the top two are, are different field strengths. So you can see the resolution changes. Um, the, the bottom two are a brain before and after contrast was added to, to diagnose a tumor. Um, the right is a catalytic cycle, right? You don't have to pay a lot of attention to that unless you want to. But what we're interested in doing there is using the, the lanthanides to form carbon-carbon bonds. And carbon-carbon and -carbon bonds are important for things like pharmaceuticals and materials. And, you know, lots of people are doing that. So what we're trying to do specifically is do this in a more environmentally friendly manner. Um, do it in, in, you know, less harmful solvents to the environment. Um, and so, like I said, five minutes, I think I might have even gone over here. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of different stories that I could have chosen to tell. And, and there's, you know, a lot of great research. You could pick anybody here. Um, and tell a great story. And, you know, this is all the faculty and, and also the support staff that really run the department. And um, again, thank, thank you for the honor of, of being invited to speak and represent the chemistry department and, and welcome. Our next presentation uh, will come via video and it features Dr. Carol Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is a professor and chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. She has been recently appointed to the Great Lakes Science Advisory Board. Her research is in the area of water resources and she focuses on surface and subsurface water quality and quantity, as well as the interface between water and energy. Dr. Miller helped launch the Urban Watershed Environmental Research Group and her presentation this morning is called Bringing Sustainability to the Great Lakes. Dr. Carol Miller. Living in the center of the world's largest freshwater resource, it's important we're good stewards of it. What we're doing has the potential to improve the overall health of our water supply. It's clear to me that the vitality of the Great Lakes are critical to the future vitality of Michigan. All of our research involves the urban environment and especially the relationship between the urban environment and the Great Lakes. This research doesn't just stay in the lab. It affects all of us. We all use water. We're very interested in the relation between water and energy. In this particular research, we can look at the health of the water as well as conservation of energy. Any improvements that we make out of our research can translate to the community very quickly. We hope to reduce the amount of energy that's used in sending water into people's homes. And by doing that, we're going to cut down on air pollution and we're going to improve the health of our Great Lakes. We're planning to pilot the software in the city of Detroit, but ultimately the software will be used by water distribution systems worldwide. More than six million people rely on the water from the Detroit River as their primary drinking source, and that includes both Canada and the U.S. Our sponsors chose Wayne State University because we're the only major research university right at the doorstep of the Great Lakes. It's very vital to the state of Michigan for many reasons. This research will lead to decreased costs for water transmission and will improve the environment. We have the most sought after freshwater resource in the world. The health and safety of this resource and the people who use it is always on our mind. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker, distinguished professor of music, Dr. James Hartway. Dr. Hartway is nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for his concerto, Cityscapes, which was commissioned by our own Detroit Symphony Orchestra. He was named the Detroit Music Awards Outstanding Classical Composer, not once, not twice, but four times. His Affair of the Harp CD, 
earned Detroit Music Award Outstanding Classical Recording. Best of all, Dr. James Hartway was made in Detroit. He is a native Detroiter, and he is also a Wayne State alumnus, presenting the creative process in modern music composition. Distinguished Professor of Music, Dr. James Hartway. What do I need to do, Joe? Well, first of all, let me, well, while Joe's figuring this out, let me tell you why I accepted the invitation from uh, Bob and Jerry to do this. Um, please. I'm happy to be a small part of this inaugural celebration because I believe that Alan Gilmore is the right man at the right place at the right time. I didn't have to say yes to this, but I really truly believe that. And, I, and if anything I can contribute to this is... And there's another reason. Um, that other reason is that uh, research, creativity, I think just absolutely go hand in hand. And there isn't really much of a distinction between the two of them. Uh, if in the last 40 years, I've, I've tried to nurture this sense of creativity that I think every human being has and all of the students that sit in front of me have. And I think it is, it's one of the roles and responsibilities of a major university like this to develop creativity in its individuals. Without, without this spark of creativity that makes us all human beings and that allows us to produce something and to realize something, even if it's just realizing ourselves, then that's what the university is here for. And so that's what I've tried to do. And so I want to tell you how I do that with music. That's basically the general plan. Uh, and, and the plan is this. Uh, I, I want to show you how from, from answering the telephone uh, one day, uh, how, how a telephone call finishes up with a large piece of music. And I have five copies, which I'll just Here's the story of a piece called Urban Pictures. Uh, about uh, a year and a half, two years ago now, I received a phone call from a wonderful jazz saxophone player whose name is Christopher Collins. Chris is the head of our jazz department at Wayne State University. Uh, but, but past that, he is a world-class saxophone player. He's a tenor saxophone player. Chris said to me, Jim, uh, I have an opportunity with an orchestra in Torino, Italy. Uh, to uh, perform a new piece of music that I'd like you to write. I'd like you to write a concerto for a jazz quintet and symphony orchestra. Now, as a composer, I began to drool a little bit. Uh, I drool because it's very difficult to get a piece of new music played uh, by an orchestra. Uh, orchestras just don't particularly do that. So I said, well, Chris, tell me more. He said, well, it's going to be about a 25-minute concerto. Uh, it's going to feature uh, two saxophones, piano, bass, and drum, and then full symphony orchestra. Well, what do you mean full symphony, Chris? Chris said, I mean uh, piccolo, two flutes, alto flute, two oboes, two clarinets, bass clarinet, two bassoons, contrabassoon, four horns, four trumpets, four trombones, tuba, four percussion players, including timpani, the jazz quintet, and 50 strings. <sighs> <laughs> okay, and then Chris said, and I have some funding. That made me even happier. That, 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 was, a good, that was a good thing. So I'm getting very excited about this. This is, a, this is a great opportunity for anybody, for any composer. And I'm thinking, gee, a performance in Torino. And then Chris said, and we're going to do it back here in Detroit when we, when we get through with Torino. And, and I'm inviting you all to that performance sometime in September probably at the uh, Detroit Jazz Festival uh, over Labor Day weekend. We'll, I'll let you know if I can. And then after all that settled in, I thought, what the hell am I going to write? Uh, this piece is supposed to sort of represent Detroit because Detroit and Torino are sister cities. And so I looked into that a little bit. And indeed, you know, Torino is, is the automobile manufacturing area in Italy. 
and of course we know what Detroit is. And Torino has also, uh, has also gone on, uh, into tough times financially, and they have emerged. They've sort of had a renaissance. Now, we've heard about the Detroit renaissance for I don't know how many years. I'm not sure that it's taken place. But maybe it's about to take place. So in order for this little spark of creativity that I referred to earlier to, to sort of take place in me, I had to have, an, I had to have a reason. I had to have a, an idea as to what this piece was going to be about. And, and then how do I represent anything with pitch, with notes? Um, that's the job of the composer. How does he do that? I mean, how, does, how do you translate what you're trying to think into sound? And does it really work? Well, I guess we'll find out. Um, so I'm thinking Detroit. Detroit. Detroit's a tough town. It really is a tough town. It's got, it's got some nice parts to it, but it's a tough town with some tough people, and it's a street smart town, as far as I can tell. I mean, I've taught down here for 40 years. I, I was born and raised, educated 12 years, Detroit schools, and then, and then seven years at Wayne State, which is a Detroit school. I think I, know the, I think I know the territory. So I'm thinking, let's get a title. Mean Streets, first movement, Mean Streets. Yeah, that, that could work. What does that mean? How do I represent that musically? What kind of a swagger does Mean Streets have? It just, it just so happens that the piece is going to have some pictures. Uh, and the piece is titled Urban Pictures. And, and pictures are going to be projected behind the orchestra as the piece is being performed. So Chris sent me a bunch of pictures. And one picture in particular stood out. There was an African American guy who everyone calls Smoke. And, and this guy had the look about him that said, I know a little something more than you do. I'm, I'm kind of slick. I, I, I kind of walk with this sort of swagger. We've all met Smoke somewhere along the line, I think. Um, and we like him. We like Smoke. He has, a certain, he has a certain joie de vivre, and he has a certain swagger, and he has a certain toughness. That's what I tried to represent this. So let me, let me show you then. We go from from uh, that to notes, I hope. I hope, there we go, is it up? There we go, okay, so. <clears throat> so through the, through the miracle of, uh, of, of a very faulty um, software program called Finale, I'm gonna show you how I started to write the piece. I went to the piano one day and I said, okay, I wanna play a tough chord, just play a chord, boom, chord. Okay, I think I'm right where I should be here, so we'll find out. That's, that ain't the chord. Okay, hang, <laughs> hang on. So we're not where we're supposed to be. If I can find where this chord is. There we go. Okay. And I should do this. I know right now you're thinking, wow, this guy, this guy is good. This, this guy is really good. So, so the chord obviously needs something. This is what it needs. It, it, needs, it needs a sense of, uh, uh, come on, don't pop up there. It needs some rhythm. You got a little rhythm now. now. Now the chord has a little bit of character to it. Now, now remember, I've got to think jazz quintet and a huge symphony orchestra. So somewhere along the line, I've got to orchestrate this chord, and, I, and I'll show you how I do that in a minute. But it, we need, now we need more than the chord, so let's just go a little bit further into the thing here. And we, we, we need some sort of rhythmic feel. Now re remember, smoke walks with a swagger. You won't hear it too much here, but you get an, you'll get some idea what it is. Oh, dear, don't do that to me. Drums, bass. That sounds like garbage. But when it's but you have to think like I'm thinking. There's a bass player playing this, and there's a drummer going. 
because Finale doesn't do all these things. Now, it needs a baseline. It need, we need some motivation for some of these notes, but we've got the chord, we've got a little bit of introductory passage, and now we need a baseline. Here's the baseline. Okay, we've got a baseline. We're going to combine all of these things. Now, now, now the balls are going up in the air, right? But, but, they, but they haven't landed, because I've got to think of a lot of things at the same time. So now there's a little lead melodic line that's going to be played by the saxophones, I conceive. Here it comes. Okay, but there are two saxophones. Here's the second part. piano so we get to play some chords then after that so now I'm now I've got the basic building blocks kind of in the piece of the piece in my mind I'm, I'm gonna play you now the combination of the bass line the saxophones and the piano part and we'll see how it's beginning to unfold so here we go got the A part of the tune. We've, we've got, got the lead part of the melodic line. I've got some ideas as to, as to what can happen uh, instrumentally with this, but there's got to be a contrasting section because Detroit isn't just about swaggering and walking down the street with a swagger. There's some nice parts to Detroit and there's a, and there's a sympathy in this town that, that you can sort of feel sometimes as you, as you go through it. And I certainly have an empathy with, with that, so I'm writing a B part now to that a section. Here that is. got the A and the B. I gave you a hint of what the introduction was going to be like. But now I've got to unfold all of this material so that my audience can grasp how this thing is kind of materializing in an organic sort of way. I, I want the music to lead somewhere. I want it to begin in a certain place and build towards some sort of climactic section so that there is a denouement in this piece. You're not going to hear it because, uh, because I can't give it to you. The, the saxophones are gonna play jazz solos in the middle of it, then this whole thing is gonna come back at the end, and it ends with a huge cadenza for two saxophones, and then a couple of big chords, and it's over. But as a composer, and as an organizer, and I'll bet this is true for many, many of the disciplines that are represented here, and certainly in this university, you get, you get an idea of what it is that you want to do, and then you figure out a way to accomplish that idea and express what it is that you're trying to say. And that was, that was what I'm trying to show you, what the basic ideas here now of this piece. Okay, so now, just hang, bear with me for one moment more, and let me open this one up. Ah, now this is what you've got in front of you if you've got a score. This is the full score to this piece. And I'll just uh, try to show you a little bit more of it. Oh, come on now. Come on. Okay. Oh, maybe I didn't press this. There we go. That'll do her. Okay. It's getting smaller. It's getting smaller. But you're getting the idea of the full score. And now it's going to get so small, you can't even see it. So that doesn't, that doesn't do anything. But if you have the full score, that's what it looks like. And, and down the left, it, that's pick, piccolo, flutes, alto flute, oboes, clarinets, etc., 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 and that's what the composer has to deal with. And somehow he has to, to orchestrate this and notate this. So as an orchestrator, I have to know, okay, the, the range of the flute is from middle C to three octaves above, 
the range of the uh, oboe is from B flat below middle C to about a, a, an octave and a fifth above that, but down at the low end, oboes sound like honking geese and you don't want to use that. Uh, clarinets have a certain range, the upper parts of the range, it sounds like you're letting chickens out of a coop, so you don't want to use that. And, and I understand, and I understand that today the president is going to be led by a bagpiper from, I guess, one of the libraries to somewhere. And I want you to know that the, <laughs> some are good, I hope. I want you to know that the range of a bagpipe is about a half a mile. <laughs> and the reason that the bagpiper walks when he's playing is because he's trying to get away from the sound. <laughs> These are, these are old music jokes. All right. So now, in the allotted time, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to play, uh, again, this wonderful software program actually uh, allows you to hear sort of what the way the instruments will sound like when it's played live, but it's never as good. So I'm going to give you the sort of the brief preview, the premiere of this piece, which will be premiered in Torino, Italy, May the 9th, just coming up just around the corner. Uh, and I understand that Mayor Dave Bing is going to be there, as well as the mayor of Torino, and uh, very much looking forward to it. So you get to hear the, the uh, really the premier performance, of the first public performance of this thing, even though it's done synthetically. And you can follow along the score, either, either on the screen here, or if you have the score and can read music. And by the way, I want those scores back. <laughs> okay? So let's see if we can hear this thing here. Uh, let me get... Let's hope to God this works. Drums. The bass line you heard. And the chord. jazz group yet. I'm saving them. Here they are. Oh, no. I was saving them, and now it's a disaster. Okay, but I will enter a number between one and two somewhere here. Come on. For one.
on to jazz solos. I, I invite you to the, uh, the premiere, and I'll try to inform people when it is, but for sure there will be a Detroit premiere of this piece next academic year. And thank you very much for your time, patience. Uh, best to you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Hartway. Wonderful. Um, we're going to bring you one more One Minute Scholar. Uh, this uh, segment is entitled Loud and Proud, and it features Dr. Cindy Burr, who's Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering and the star of ESPN's Sports Science. So take a look, One Minute Scholar. We're at the music recording studios at Wayne State University, and I'm recording my mom a birthday song. One, two, three, four! So I call her up, I'm like, Mom, I'm writing you a birthday song. And she's like, Donnie, less hitting the high notes, more hitting the study notes. So, Rolling. oh, we're ready to go? Cool. Can I get more snare? More kick, too. Yeah, yeah, feel it. Cowbell, awesome. Yeah, louder's better. Actually, Tony. Oh, hey, Professor. Louder isn't better. And let me explain why. As the sound waves enter your outer ear, they hit your eardrum and excite these three bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. That amplifies the sound at the oval window. As the sound then travels down the cochlea, you have tiny little hair cells. And what these hair cells do is they move with that vibration and release neurochemicals. As the sound goes through, they actually excite the neurons. They release a neurochemical which excites your auditory nerves so you can hear. If you damage these hair cells, you completely wipe them out. Once they're gone, they're gone for good. Cause damage to your hearing that you cannot get back. As you get older, that's why you get harder of hearing because those hair cells break with time. So keep in mind, if you're gonna listen to music using your headphones, the person next to you shouldn't be able to hear that music and you should be able to hear that. Yeah, no one wants to go bald early in the ears. If you wanna turn up the volume in your life, check out what else Wayne State has to offer. So when we tell these kids to turn that volume down, it is based on scientific fact, which are not just nagging. We are going to sort of round out the first half of the symposium by turning things over to our, our three tenors over there. Once again, Jerry Heron, Bob Sokol, and Seymour Wolfson, who will facilitate a discussion about the presentations we've seen. Gentlemen. Thank you, Kevin. And not to get all academic, but as you well may know, the symposium is an ancient tradition. Uh, it's a celebration of good company and fellowship. And I think, as our presenters have made clear this morning, we're in very good company. You could not imagine better fellowship, I think, than this. And we want to engage you as well, our audience, in this good company and fellowship. And it also occurred to me during the presentations and the variety of different speeches, the, diff the variety of different content that we've been looking at, we're also lucky to be in the good company and the fellowship of teachers. And it's an extraordinary gift, I think, that the university gives to ourselves and to each other to be in the company of teachers and teachers who take their teaching and do good in the world. Uh, the profound humanity, I think, of these presentations makes me proud to be among the three tenors this morning in such good company and fellowship. Um, that's by way of an introduction to say if anyone else wants to get in, well, first I guess. I think we ought to see if uh, people have comments and questions uh, from those in attendance. Hi. Uh, first of all, I think it's a very good way of uh, celebrating the inauguration by having a symposium like this. In this way, we can know what other professors uh, are what type of research work they are doing in this university. So it's, uh, I think, an excellent idea to have this. Uh, regarding questions, I think it's a, a sort of discussion uh, I have for the first speaker. 
I think we gave an excellent presentation, Robert, uh, Roberto Romero, on uh, the genetic diseases. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good presentation, and especially as it's having a collaboration between uh, medical school and engineering. Uh, but I want to draw uh, your attention on uh, some of the other uh, uh, genetic diseases. For example, we are in the city of Detroit, and we are in the neighborhood of uh, African-American community, our black community, and I think it's our duty of Wayne State University to take care of a large number of uh, genetic diseases of uh, uh, black community. I think you mentioned in your presentation that uh, the people have the prob uh, cardiovascular problems at the age of 65, but in the sickle cell anemia, which is extremely, uh, I mean, they're in the black community, they suffer all their life. And I don't think much attention has been paid for by medical community even to take care of or eradicate this problem of sickle cell anemia. And I think as a Wayne State, it has been, it is our duty. I've been trying to advocate uh, to have an advanced center of sickle cell anemia in the city of Detroit. My question to you is, sir, that is the, as your research, which is uh, having a nanomedicine, uh, uh, will take care of a similar diseases like genetic diseases like uh, sickle cell anemia or not? Thank you very much for your question, and I have three comments to make. The last one about sickle cell disease. We have been engaged in the study of what genetic factors in African Americans predispose to certain diseases, and we have identified genetic variants that are carried by individuals of African American origin that predispose to adverse pregnancy outcome, in particular preterm birth. Uh, a paper that we published um, three years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science identified that some genetic variants predispose to this, but I don't believe that there is a genetic determinism for one ethnic group or another. I speak with an accent because I come from South America. We have a higher frequency of diabetes. I think that what happens here is that when we were, came from Africa, we were challenged by different environmental insults. And one of the ways to deal with that is inflammation. And we carry, to some extent, the variants that help us deal with inflammation. And it happens that some of those variants have been retained by some ethnic groups better than others because they help us fight disease in Africa. We have found an association between those DNA variants and the risk of preterm birth. To address the question of sickle cell disease, what I can tell you is today we have one, a method for early diagnosis in the prenatal period of those individuals who are affected, and that is being offered to the community at the Detroit Medical Center and Wayne State University School of Medicine. But one of the challenges is, can we treat this condition? Sickle cell disease was one of the first genetic disorders to be elucidated. It is caused by a change in a single base pair. And it is yet, we need to transform that in that advance, one of the first advances in molecular medicine into therapy, and that is one of the challenges that we have ahead. It is an unsolved challenge at the moment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Darren Ellis from the College of Engineering. I had a pr uh, question for Professor Hartway. Um, I, I really liked your comments about creativity and the creative process and how it's a part of all innovation and research across the university. I was wondering if you could comment on um, overcoming barriers to creativity or encouraging creativity with, with students. I mean, you showed a great example of your own creativity, but how can we draw this out in our student population? It's a, it's a, it's a great question, and there's a simple answer to it. And I quote Stephen King. Now he's, he's, it's, he, he, does, he says it this way, writing equals ass in chair. And, and there isn't any way around it. Uh, you know, you, you, you can pray all you like for this spark, but if you don't sit down and you don't try it and you don't start something, it's, not, it's never going to happen. I can guarantee you that. So the, it's, it's, it's 
creativity is a lot of hard work. Some thought, and then get to it, baby. Don't, don't waste any time. There, there isn't enough time in the first place. Oh, good. There you go. <laughs> Bravo. Jim, I wonder if I can follow up to that question. Because in listening to music, I have two questions. One, why music? Is something that all cultures have it. Um, and second, the, it, just to bring an example of the question of creativity, wondering when can the fetus learn and can music be used as an instrument to answer the question? Because for sure, the fetus can hear. Can we use the tools that you have? Now, now you know I cannot answer that question. I don't have the background to answer that question at all. But there is something to be said for, for fetal development as in, in utero fetal development. I guess I'm redundant already. Uh, that, that listening to music for the pregnant mother can apparently stimulate the brain. Uh, I don't know. There's some abstract quality about music. Every culture has it. I don't know why it works. But I do know that it does work. And I do know that with, with children, uh, certainly educational development and music lessons go hand in hand and people that have uh, some sort of musical background it's been proven again and again and again they do better just generally in their academics you have to tell me why I can't tell you I can't tell. Dr. Romero I was concerned with uh, the ginger mirrors Does it matter when the application was made and is there a window when it closes when it's no longer effective or is there some component of it that makes it effective? So the question is, when do the dendromeres work and when is it too late? We know that some, the cerebral palsy is diagnosed in children. We have to wait to the age of three. Sometimes babies have a motor disorder that improves or disappears. So your question is very good because what we now know is that we, can, we need to detect nerve inflammation early. And inflammation is what the body uses to respond to an insult, but it leads to a scar, the way we heal through inflammation. So there is such a thing as too late. And we are trying to begin to find out how early we can administer, because we know that there is a too late. So our goal is to identify inflammation at birth, and actually the frontier is to identify before birth, uh, so that we don't administer this therapy. I, I, I'm Seymour Wolfson. I, I first uh, would like everyone to sort of acknowledge once again our first five speakers for such a wonderful presentation. <laughs> I personally find uh, to be rather humbled by this fantastic presentation. Uh, I've been here for many years at the university and I had no idea of the broad range of research that is going on in all of these different areas. And it's really nice to hear all of this coming together and we're only hearing a small little piece of the tip of an iceberg of Wayne State University. You're gonna hear some more this afternoon uh, for another hour and uh, we'll talk more about these. But um, it's just really wonderful to hear uh, what all of my colleagues here are doing at Wayne State University. And it's just uh, wonderful to bring all of this together uh, to this symposium. Kicking off the, the second half of our symposium uh, this afternoon is Dr. Mary Elizabeth Anderson. She is assistant professor of theater and founding director of the Performance Exchange, which is our theater department's community engagement and touring company. Her research explores the intersections of place and paradigms of performance training. And she's joined this afternoon uh, by a few actors from our award-winning and nationally recognized Hillbury Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, from our theater department, Dr. Mary Elizabeth Anderson, and her troupe from the Hillbury Theater. Dr. Anderson. Hi, 
everybody. We're so pleased to be here. Um, I'm Mary Elizabeth Anderson. This is my student, Sienna Hassett. She's a BFA uh, senior in the theater department. And Ermin Jones, who is a graduating member of the Hellberry Company. Uh, so today, we're going to show you an experiment. We have been asked by the, uh, by the panel to show you a rehearsal in process which is kind of crazy, because usually rehearsals are a closed process um, in, in the sense that we show something to ourselves um, in order to try to better understand the play. And in, in the, the making of a play or the staging of a play, you uh, don't necessarily have a particular outcome in mind. You just want to go deeper and deeper into the given circumstances of the play, understanding the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, so today, we're gonna show you a little bit of that. We've selected a passage from the final scene of Uncle Vanya, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a play written by Anton Chekhov in 1897 and first staged in 1899 at the Moscow Art Theater. And um, both Ehrman and Siena are graduates of, of Wayne State's unique um, intensive training program at the School of the Moscow Art Theater. So they've just come back from a, a month of training there. Wayne is actually one of only three programs in <laughs> one of only three programs in the United States um, uh, in which uh, American students are permitted or invited to train um, on an annual basis in Moscow. So it's quite a unique experience. Um, what we're going to do today is uh, um, we're going to run a scene three times. The first time we're going to run it, the actors are going to. Um, acquaint themselves with the, uh, the language of the script. The second time we're going to run it, um, we're going to use music as a way to uh, get closer to our characters. Um, so we're going to go off book. In other words, we're not going to use our script at all. We're just going to use music. And then the third time we're going to run it again, take the music away, and, um, and use the words again. So this is our experiment. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Just to give a little bit of a setup for the scene, Armin's going to be playing Dr. Astroff, who's had a huge crush on Yelena for the longest time. Yelena and her elderly husband um, have been staying at a country estate, and Yelena's husband, who she's not very in love with, um, has been ailing this whole time. Dr. Astroff has been taking care of her husband and has had this kind of growing attraction for Yelena. Um, and Yelena has not been forthcoming in response to his advances. So we're going to see this final, in the final scene, Yelena is departing, and um, this is their last moment to be together alone. I'm leaving. Goodbye. Already? Here. Bye then. There's just one thing I'd like to ask. Do you try to believe I'm really a good person? I want you to respect me. Oh, come on. Why not stay? You know, you're going to give in to your passion eventually. Why not do it here? You look all weather, all these trees, and the bosom of nature. What a silly man you are. Well, we won't see each other again, so why hide it? I was attracted to you a little. So let's shake hands and part friends, shall we? Why not? 
here, go get in. We're going to do it again. This time we're going to add another character to the room. We're going to take these guys' words away, but we're going to add music. In this sense, getting the words out of the way of the actor is a way for the actor to connect more deeply with their intention or what they want. So in this case, we know that Dr. Astroff wants Yelena, and he's made that clear throughout the play. We now know that Yelena really has wanted Dr. Astroff all along, but societal conventions prevent her from actually getting what she wants, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna add the music in and the actors are gonna be able to play their intentions again, but without the kind of burden or the baggage of the words. And this time I'd like both actors to kind of think of something in the, in the back of their head. So Sienna, I'd like you to think about what waits for you in the carriage. So I'd like, I'd like you to think about kind of the weight that's out there and what, you know what I mean, what you're kind of getting away from in this little bubble of privacy with Dr. Astroff. So it's, it's so unusual that you should even be in private with Dr. Astroff. So what does it mean to kind of come from the weight of what waits for you in the carriage back into this space? And then Dr. Astroff, I'd like you to think a little bit about um, how surprised you are by this news. So is this something that you expected? Did you always know, had you always anticipated that Yelena would leave? Um, and is this announcement of her departure uh, sudden, or is it something that you know that that you've expected? Okay.
So as you can see, that's a kind of an abstracted version with a kind of a slowed down timing. So these actors had never heard that song before. <laughs> it's a kind of a unique experiment, a song kind of catered to cultivate a rich inner life for each of them. And so now they're going to take that and apply that and run the scene one more time and we can see the kind of effect, the before and the after. Already? The carriage is here. Bye then. Uh, just one thing I'd like to ask you. If you try to believe I'm a good person, I want you to respect me. Come on. Why not stay? You're going to give in to your feelings eventually. Wouldn't it be better to do it here, in the bosom of nature? Beautiful fall weather. Lots of trees. God, what a silly man you are! As a souvenir. There's no one around. So let me. Uh... I wish you all the best. Oh, once in my life, why not? Carriage is here. Get in, go. So what I hope you saw <laughs> was a kind of a migration towards increasing truth that the actors were able to, over time, just through sheer repetition, um, get closer and closer to their characters and closer and closer to their intentions and to each other. So thank you very much.
Dr. Anderson and, and actors and ooh, spice things up a little bit. I don't know about you, but uh, that was very nice. Really like that. Um, and we've got something else great coming up. And our next presentation actually is via video. Uh, and it comes to us from Dr. Jeffrey Loeb, who is Associate Professor of Genetics here at Wayne State University. And he's going to present us with Unraveling Epilepsy. Please take a look. I mean, it's really about the patients for me. I mean, if I'm, I'm gonna get emotional, it's gonna be, we're doing this for the people that suffer from this disease. And I can't think of any better satisfaction in my career is to come up with something that can actually translate back to people that I take care of and improve their quality of life. That's from the heart. Epilepsy is one of the least understood diseases in the most complicated organ, the brain. It affects over 70 million people worldwide. One of the hardest things to tell a patient when they come with, to me with epilepsy is that we don't have a cure and you will be on this medicine often for the rest of your life. At present time, when patients do not respond to medications, the only treatment we have is to open the skull and remove parts of the brain that cause the seizures. The goal of this research program is to come up with a cure so we no longer have to do this. Well, we've taken a, a unique approach to study the human brain for patients who have epilepsy surgery. And we have a very unique ability to look at many different things from genes to proteins to small molecules and piece them together through complex computational methods to find new drugs and new targets to treat and cure epilepsy. Next time I have a patient who comes to me with epilepsy, I would like to say, well, here, take this, as opposed to now where we don't have that option. We now have the ability to look at many millions and millions of variables simultaneously and try to simplify the problem into something that can generate a solution. To my knowledge, this type of research is not being done anywhere else in the world that combines so many different aspects to understand uh, diseases of the human brain. And because of our close relationship with the Detroit Medical Center and our interaction between the clinics and the basic science here, we have a unique opportunity to do this and to bring these things together to come up with a cure. Many things happen in our laboratory. Uh, we start with human brain tissue. Uh, we look at the genes, the proteins, the small molecules. Uh, we do experiments uh, on cultures of tissues. And we use this information to come up with ideas, new research directions, and hopefully cures. One of the most valuable assets we have here is our students. We have the most wonderful PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, undergraduate students that come through the laboratory and their learning process contributes greatly to our research programs. We're on a path to curing a life-altering disease and I'm proud that it's happening here at Wayne State University. I'm pleased to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Wee Song Shi. He's Associate Professor of Computer Science here at Wayne State, Director of the Mobile and Internet Systems Laboratory, Co-Director of the Laboratory for Sustainable Computing. He's received the National Science Foundation Career Award, and Dr. Shi has received the Wayne State University Career Development Career Chair Award, presenting Toward Trust and Sustainable Cloud Computing, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wee Song Shi. Well, thank you very much for the uh, <clears throat> for the introduction. So it's my great honor to be a part of uh, President. Uh, Gilmore's uh, in inaugural events, and also very excited to hear what my colleagues have been doing at Wayne State. So cloud computing is a very hot and, uh, and buzzword these days, and particularly in this, in this uh, economy. So cloud computing actually have uh, promised for us to save the cost. That's why it's very uh, popular, has been viewed by many different sectors. So in the next few minutes, I would like to share with you, you know, why this cloud computing is important and what's the key 
challenges we are facing and also the actions that have been taken at the computer science. So let's start with this, uh, uh, the big switch. This is a book written by Nicholas Carr. In his book, he argued that the computing industry will be doing the similar thing as what the electricity industry has been doing in the last 100 years. So most of us today, we are used the electricity, but then starting with about 100 years ago, Thomas Edison, in his view is, each of the organization gonna have their own generator, just like this. For example, we instead should have our own power generator. It took 40 years for one of his former employees called Samuel Enel to build this infrastructure-based electricity distribution. That's what we are having today, but it's taken 40 years when the first uh, infrastructure was built in the United States. Similarly, in the cloud computing, uh, in this uh, computing industry, so most of us uh, get used to building our in-house cluster for our research. So what happened today, Nicholas is arguing that we actually is moving to a cloud computing era. So before we go to these details, let's take a look of where are we now. So most of you probably, you already in this kind of uh, situation, for example, most of us are using software, now it's used as a service, such as we're using Wednesday the email, rather than we're still downloading the email to our local uh, computers. And some of us, particularly, at the, I, I'm aware of that in medical school and also computer science, we're not building our own cluster anymore. Most of our students are doing our research directly at Amazon EC2, because this way we can save the cost. Hardware and you know, system management probably can cut to one-tenth of the, what we are doing. So here is uh, some examples we will hear. For example, Dropbox, which can be used uh, quite popular. When I come here to give a presentation, I don't bring anything here because all of my stuff is in the cloud. Also, our personal life and also for the uh, scientific research, most of our data now can be hosted at the, on the cloud side. So in the cloud computer era, basically there are two players. On one, one hand is the data center is a computer, which is hiding in the cloud. On the other hand is the age of the cloud, including all these kind of mobile devices. There's a potential here is by, by the year 2020, we're gonna have four billion number of these mobile devices. So basically in the future, you're gonna see these two ends. So first, let's take a look of the data center is a computer. What does this really mean to us? So for example, traditionally we have a software is running on our desktop. Now, most of this is running on the web. You can search Gmail. Those are basically is the program gonna running on the data center. Also, the computer gonna be looking like this. Most like this, we call the warehouse computer, uh, in simply called the uh, WSC. So he, most of these companies nowadays are working eagerly towards this, uh, you know, the future computer. Maybe five years later, we will see that CNIT at the Wayne State University gonna buy this one for our data center rather than host it in a huge, uh, huge you know, facility. So this is, so far, is probably the most efficient you know, data center has been built in the world. So this is a nice thing. However, in order to move to this, uh, to our reality, yesterday when I talked to uh, Jeff, who is the uh, faculty in the between the faculty and the, and the CNIT, his concern is, wow, I don't want to put in my stuff on the cloud because I don't trust them. So trust is the number one issue before we can completely move into that. For example, whether we instead are gonna move in our, all the student records, research stuff go to the cloud. So this is a still a, a issue that we need to think about. First of all, is that all the data when we store in this uh, cloud is a big problem. I know that many faculty members at, at, at the computer science, including uh, Dr. Futui, and we are also working on the privacy the issues here, trying to pave the way for us to accept uh, to in, the, in this cloud computing era. So, uh, one of the work that I have been doing in my group is, this is an NSF funded five-year project that we're looking for to building a, you know, a using a trust model to building this, uh, to solve this trust issue, but it's only part of that. The whole world now is a lot of people is working in this area. So because of time limit, I'm not gonna go to details for this work. So one of this model we have developed called PAT, it actually has been widely used by the uh, colleagues all around the world. So the next thing I want to talk about is sustainability. So Professor Miller just now in, in, in her talk he mentioned the sustainability of the water, but this figure is taken in 2009 in Norway, basically shows that you know, the weather, because of climate change and this ice is starting to melt down, just like the, the mother earth is crying. 
So basically, we need to take action here. So why is this related to the computer science? You might, at the beginning, you might wor worry about this. So basically, the two angles. The first, first thing is, this figure shows that from EPA that the number of the energy consumed by the data centers is keeping in increasing. By the end of this year, 2.5% of all the energy spent in the United States is on data centers. It is itself costs $7.4 billion a year for this. Also, looking for the carbon dioxide here is generated by the data centers is equal to 17 million house households that we are generating. So that's why we really need to take in the actions here. Uh, for example, here I just show you an example. Nowadays, both uh, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, when they want to build the data center, they have to build the data center next to the power plant. So here is an example in Oregon. This is the largest data center so far in, in the world. Google has been built secretly in, that, uh, in, this, in the Oregon site. So the actions we have been doing at the Computer Science is uh, two of my colleagues, Dr. Brockmeyer and Dr. Fisher, and we formed a lab for sustainable computing last year. Basically, we have 16 PhD students working together to target this from two perspectives. Now, the first perspective is how do we make this IT itself green to save the energy for the data centers? On the other hand, we're also looking for how do we leverage these innovative applications in the cyber physical system. So in the first part, there is, we have created a code green umbrella project. Basically, we're looking for how do we do the power and the thermal management in mobile devices and data centers. Also, we have been actively developed tools to help us to, uh, help this, to do this uh, power saving. Also, we actively looking with uh, colleagues at Wayne State and also the internationally to building these uh, three key areas, including the smart grid. For example, how do we save the energy uh, here? Also, uh, automobiles and the environmental health. So those are the areas that we are currently uh, actively working on. So to give you one example of how big you know, the impact we can, gener we can, can be done in the, from the computer science point of view is, this is a figure of what we have today. For most, uh, most of our desktops, even if you are not using the computer, it still consumes 50% of the power. That's the currently what we have. For example, this computer now is still consuming 50% of the peak power. So what we are doing now, in our lab is we're trying to reduce this idle, the ideally is good to as less as possible. So with this, we can save all of the, all the computers, you know, the energy has been consumed by when the system is idle. As a part of, uh, as a reality, most of, of our computers are only busy at 5% of the, of the day. So that's why it's a significant saving here. Last week, our group just released the open source, part, uh, software called the PTOF, which is the first, you know, the uh, pure software-based approach that can allow you to tell, to see which application is consuming how much power, how much energy on your computer. So this one, just released the last week, has been widely uh, used now by the, uh, by the other colleagues in, in the world. So in addition to the activity at, at the Wayne State, we are also actively participating with uh, collaborating with other institutions. So this is just to show you a figure that we have been working together with University of Michigan, Stanford University, and Arizona State. We are building this uh, using a 10-year map. How do we make the system software more energy efficient to save the power of, this, uh, of the uh, future generation of computers? So finally, I would like to acknowledge all the sponsors who sponsor our research, including this uh, federal uh, government, some industry. Particularly, I want to mention is Huawei, which is the second largest telecommunication company based in China, uh, this year just uh, give us, uh, give us uh, delayed some research gift here for us to continue working in this area. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. David Sinabro. Uh, Dr. Sinabro is a professor of physics and astronomy. He is an experimental particle physicist and astronomer. Uh, his research is in particle physics and astronomy, and uh, his project is funded by the National Science Foundation. And he's here to present research highlights from the Wayne State University Department of Physics and Astronomy.
Dr. Sinabro. Okay, hey, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to talk about highlights from a, a department which consists of 27 faculty, uh, 10 research staff, and about 62 graduate students. Um, uh, so it's a large department. I can't hope to cover everything we do at, at the physics department, so I'll just give you three, three highlight areas. Um, the first is in, in, and we start at the smallest scale. This is subatomic physics, trying to study the physics of the nucleus. Um, this is done at uh, the, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island in New York. Um, and it's also done at the, uh, the CERN uh, lab in Geneva, Switzerland at the Large Hadron Collider, um, where uh, at the Alice, ex Alice and Star experiment, or the two experiments. Um, the Alice experiment, for example, has over 1,000 collaborators from, 100 in from over 100 institutes from 31 countries, including professors Cormier, Gavin, Pernod, and Voloshin here at Wayne State. Um, uh, Professor Voloshin has led, uh, tried to understand exactly how the strong interaction works. The strong interaction is what holds the nucleus together, what holds, what holds protons and neutrons together, and it's what they're studying when they bash these uh, heavy ions together. They're creating conditions like that existed at the very early universe. And he is discovering things like the, 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 the search for parity violation. Parity is the ability to, to tell, tell between right and left, and he's be able to tell that this, this strong interaction is not agnostic between right and left it prefers one side or the other. Um, uh, that has been featured in uh, Scientific American. Uh, he's also, the, they've discovered a whole bunch of things at, with this soup of quarks and gluons, which are the basic building blocks of the protons and neutrons. Um, they've discovered that jets, which are the caused by the protons and the neutron, uh, the, the quarks and the gluons flying out. They're quenched inside this thing. They're basically eaten up by that stuff. He's also discovered what's called elliptical flow, which basically shows that that mix of quarks and gluons, it behaves sort of like a perfect liquid. That is, it's a liquid with no viscosity. It flows it flows uh, without without being stopped. Um, uh, that that uh, uh, has, has featured as it's been discovered again at, at they first saw this plus revolution first lead, led sawing this at uh, star at Brookhaven and has again seen it again at, uh, at CERN in, at, in the LHC era. Um, let me move on to the atomic scale. Uh, Professor Hoffman uh, studies the, the properties of water in confined spaces. Um, that This is relevant in bio, biomechanical structures, trying to build nano-sized nano machines that use fluids, and it's also uh, trying to understand how friction works and uh, nanotribology, that is what happens when two surfaces pass over each other. Um, he's built in his lab a what's called an uh, atomic force microscope, um, and you can see here various parts of that, and he and his student showing, you, showing off the, the AFM in his lab. Um, what they're trying to understand is the mechanics of water in these very tight things. A water molecule has a scale of about 0.15 nanometers, and his atomic force mi um, microscope measures that at, at a small fraction of that. And you can see he's basically measuring sort of on the same scale of an eye of an ant what's going on. Um, the, the, the interesting thing that they've discovered is that water forms molecular layers, and up to about six layers, it behaves differently from bulk water. Um, basically, nanoscale water becomes solid when it's squeezed slowly, but, it's, but if it's not thing, it's still behaving like a liquid. So this tells us how these small, um, the, the, these small um, water-based machines work. Um, this work was uh, featured in, in an APS uh, viewpoint in, in uh, last year, um, and also featured in Na Nature India, and it was called an experimental tour de force happening here in our labs at, at the Wayne State Phys Physics Building. Finally, I'll come to my own area of research. Um, this is M51, the spiral of the Whirlpool Galaxy, one of the neighboring galaxies of the Milky Way. A picture there on the um, left is in June 2005, and on the right, July 2005. The sharp-eyed should be able to notice a new star appearing in that galaxy just below the nucleus. Um, that is a supernova explosion. Stars at the end of the life, they've consumed all their fuel, they explode, and some sorts of them glow as bright as an entire galaxy of billions, hundreds of billions of stars for about a couple of weeks before they fade away and disappear forever. Um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has been called the world's most successful science experiment, has its goal to map a quarter of the sky measure the positions and brightness of 100 million objects, find the distances to a million galaxies and 100,000 quasars, find something like 5,000 supernova. It's done with a two and a half meter telescope in New Mexico, the Apache Point 
Observatory and I collaborate on this project. Um, what we do with those supernova is we combine them. The ones from the SDSS, the Sun Digital Sky Survey, are shown with green on that plot on the top, top right there. Um, they're combined with things from larger telescopes, the, the, the Supernova Legacy Survey, at smaller telescopes, Low Z and Astronomers Speak, and the Hubble Space Telescope to make um, what's called the Hubble Diagram. What we learn from that Hubble Diagram is that, that there's something funny going on in the universe. Something seems to be pushing it apart, some mysterious force that we've dubbed, dubbed dark energy. Uh, when you combine the measurements of supernova that you see there in blue with the measurement of the cosmic microwave background, which you see there in kind of orange, and the clustering of galaxies, which is, which is in green, BAO, we, we find that we live in a very strange universe, a universe with, that is only filled with 5% atoms, 23% um, is dark matter, which is some mysterious form of matter that dominates galaxies, and it is dominated, the universe is dominated by this mysterious force, we call it dark energy, that's pushing the universe apart faster and faster and faster. So this crowning achievement of cosmology is to realize that we're basically completely ignorant about 95% of the universe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's make believe. Take your make believe compasses out, draw a circle with a radius of eight miles. <laughs> Within that circle, there are 100,000 children, most of whom struggle every day just to get the kinds of educational lifetime opportunities that other kids get as a matter of course. In 1992, we created uh, the Math Corps to try to do something about this to help in a small way. The Math Corps serves middle school and high school kids in Detroit. It features summer camps, Saturday programs, and a very strong mentoring component where our high school kids uh, serve as big brothers and big sisters for our little kids, and college students serve as big brothers and big sisters for the high school kids and the little kids. Um, the results of the program have been dramatic. Um, over 90% of our kids graduate high school. We're running an ACT average of 21.6 as compared to 16. But, <laughs> you guys got bad timing. Because <laughs> now I'm gonna say, but we've gotta do more. We've gotta do more. We have a greater dream now of Math Corps academies, schools, across the city. Spreading the Math Corps culture, spreading its philosophy. We do teach math, um, and we actually have a, a revolutionary new curriculum that we, we believe is, is actually the cure for arithmetic and algebra um, across the country, but that's, that's a different talk. Um, this talk, I'd like to talk about the philosophy of the math core, because that's, that's its essence. There's a problem with believing in kids. It makes you crazy. <laughs> Your program starts to break all kinds of rules. It flies in the face of conventional wisdom, and you become a total whack job. So when we see a kid who can't add one plus one, we now see a kid who will be a future mathematician. When we see a kid who beats the crap out of some other kid, we see a beautiful, sweet child who just did a really bad thing. There are no bad kids in the math core, only beautiful, sweet kids, good kids who do bad things sometimes, like us. So for us, our kids got to be there every day. They got to be on time. Nobody walks into a math class late. Don't tell me better late than never. That's for the rest of the world. For us, no. You don't walk in late. Homework every night. And if you don't give us enough homework, we'll flunk you. So we have failed kids who have gotten 99s on their final exam. 99s on their final exam. 99 averages in the course. Flunk them. Didn't give us enough homework. We play hardball. We substitute our own fairness doctrine. Our fairness doctrine 
is that you don't treat everybody equally. You care about everybody equally. You care about every child equally. And you treat them the way they need to be treated, in their own way. I think the, what it comes down to is that we're all beautiful in some way or some ways. We're all beautiful in some ways. And in all the other ways, we're good enough. And if you think about what that means, what does that mean? I think what that means is we're all good enough to be loved by someone. We're all good enough to be loved by someone. And we're all good enough to love. My father, my father owned a little store in Brooklyn, New York for 45 years. When he died in 1990, the president of the Gerritsen Beach Neighborhood Association called up my mother and said, Mrs. Khan, we are so sorry for your loss. But we would like to honor Jack and you and your boys with a parade down Garrison Avenue. A parade down Garrison Avenue. My father sold socks. My father sold socks. But my mother and me and my brother rode in an open top convertible down Garrison Avenue with people on the streets having signs saying, we miss you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. My father sold socks but he had greatness within him. And the really wild thing is, so do we all. My father moved an entire neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. We might be able to move a city. And if we do, they just might throw a parade for us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Dr. David Rosenberg. He is the professor of psychiatry and behavioral neurosciences. He is also the Marion L. Hamburger Endowed Chair of Child Psychiatry in our School of Medicine. He's internationally recognized as an expert on psychiatric disorders in children and young adults. And he has served as the principal investigator on many National Institute of Mental Health projects. Please welcome, with his presentation, A New Approach in Child Psychiatry, Dr. David Rosenberg. Thank you uh, very much. It's a real honor to be here representing the Department of Psychiatry and School of Medicine. Um, I also deeply appreciate President Gilmore's uh, commitment to the academic mission here at Wayne State, evidenced by uh, today's presentations, I think it's especially important during these challenging times, and it's something that uh, continues to both uh, motivate and inspire us. It means uh, something extra to me. Uh, my father was professor of surgery here at uh, Wayne State. One of my fondest childhood memories is of his taking me with him on his hospital patient rounds. So I literally grew up here at Wayne State and have always enjoyed being part of the Wayne State family. That being said, I grew up in a family of surgeons. My father, my brother, two uncles, three cousins. So you can imagine what it was like for me when I told everyone that I was gonna be a psychiatrist. <laughs> Fortunately, they seem to have come to terms with, uh, with it, especially after my wife, uh, Jennifer, a pediatric psychologist, joined the family uh, doubling our number. Our team at Wayne State is involved in caring for and researching childhood depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And we were honored earlier this year when our clinical research program was designated as uh, one of the world's top 10 treatment centers. And our work combining MRI, brain imaging, and genetics has also attracted the attention of the National Institute of Mental Health, who've encouraged us and supported us in forming a large consortium with the University of Michigan and University of Toronto. Wayne State 
is the lead coordinating center uh, for this consortium and on a large collaborative R01 grant. So in the interest of time today, I'm going to show you a few snapshots of some of the discoveries in our lab that were recently featured on ABC's uh, 2020 World News Tonight in Good Morning America. And I can't say enough about how much the work that we're doing here is facilitated by the unique infrastructure at Wayne State. Because Wayne State is the only pediatric center in the country with both MRI and PET scanning capability in a pediatric center, the Children's Hospital of Michigan. And it's one of the reasons the children and their families come to Detroit from all over the country, because you're not going to find it in New York. You're not going to find it in Boston. You're not going to find it in Los Angeles. The only place you're going to find it is here in Detroit, at Wayne State, the Detroit Medical Center, and the Children's Hospital of Michigan. One of our first efforts in the slide shown here was to examine the role of the brain chemical glutamate in a variety of childhood psychiatric disorders. And what we learned was that if serotonin is like the light in this room that allows us to see, glutamate is the brain's light switch. It turns serotonin on and off. And what we know is that ordinarily, um, glutamate controls serotonin release. And when we experience an unpleasant sensation, that our hands are sticky, that uh, they're dirty, that we need to check to make sure a door's locked, the stove's turned off, that triggers the release of serotonin. And in a healthy person, glutamate's working properly. It tells the serotonin how much, how long, and uh, how effectively serotonin should be turned on. And so if you're healthy, glutamate says, OK, serotonin, turn off. The turn off, you don't have to continue um, for their obsessions, we get the all clear signal that everything's okay. A child with obsessive compulsive disorder, one of the illnesses we study, never gets the all clear signal because their glutamate isn't properly communicating with serotonin and they never get that all clear signal. Um, we here at Wayne State published the first paper showing that glutamate, this brain chemical, is not only abnormal in obsessive compulsive disorder children, but that it can be normalized with effective treatment. And what I'm showing you here is a brain scan in a 12-year-old girl who had been admitted to an outside community hospital after becoming so severely malnourished, she had to be hospitalized and hooked up to an IV to feed her. And it so happened that her mother, a pediatric nurse, um, saw a PBS special uh, featuring our, our program and had her transferred to Wayne State in the Detroit Medical Center. What we found is that she didn't have anorexia nervosa or an eating disorder. She had a very severe form of obsessive compulsive disorder where she was so afraid of the food being contaminated, the food making her choke and her uh, not being able to eat it, that she became this emaciated. And what you can see on this brain scan is an obvious chemical abnormality before treatment that normalizes after effective comprehensive behavioral and pharmacotherapy. Now our group at Wayne State was also the first to publish a combined brain imaging and genetic study in child psychiatry. In this case where we showed that specific genetic abnormalities in where glutamate, this brain chemical, lands and is received were associated with abnormal brain glutamate levels. And why is this significant? Well, here's where Wayne State allows us to not only develop these uh, methodologies in a laboratory, but to try them out clinically. And so a whole new class of medicines called glutamate modulating drugs are now being used clinically in adults and children with obsessive compulsive disorder. One, called Riliazole, is FDA approved for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. Had never, ever been used in obsessive compulsive disorder. Based on the work here at Wayne State that was so promising, 
The National Institute of Mental Health has funded a double-blind, placebo-controlled study of riliazole in pediatric obsessive compulsive disorder. And there are other glutamate modulating drugs, N-acetylcysteine um, and topiramate, among others, memantine, used in patients with Tylenol overdose, used in patients with Parkinson's disease, that are now being routinely used in our clinic and clinics across the country. So a nice example of translational work and why industry is excited, among others, in what we're doing in developing new and safer glutamate modulating drugs. We also study children with uh, bipolar disorder and major depression, and we've used a new technique measuring the thickness of the cortex or brain. And what's interesting here is that we can distinguish with this technique patients um, who have not only obsessive compulsive disorder, but distinguish depressed children. So depressed children were distinguished not only from healthy children, but children uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder. And the most fascinating part of this work to me was that we found that depressed children, even if they presented identically in the clinic with the same signs and symptoms, that based on whether or not they had a family history, one first degree relative with depression, their brain chemistry, brain anatomy, and cortical thickness were completely different. So that we found abnormal brain changes in over 80% of depressed children who had a family history of depression or bipolar disorder, and in less than 20% of those patients who had no obvious family history of depression or bipolar disorder. We think these have enormous treatment implications because probably only 40% of children with clinical depression uh, respond to available therapies right now. And then I just want to uh, end up by saying a work of this nature obviously requires a multidisciplinary effort. We've benefited uh, from many uh, groups here. We were able to form the first uh, pediatric bipolar research program thanks to the World Heritage Foundation, Shutt Foundation, and United Way. Um, Dr. Paul Strauss, an alumni here at Wayne State, helped us uh, form a integrated uh, program. Miriam Hamburger uh, endowed the chair of child psychiatry. And uh, I see that Dr. Ratner is here in the audience. And the uh, OVPR, Office for Vice President for Research, have really literally in many ways saved our program and allowed us to uh, continue doing our work. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention. This evening we are going to create a potion for the mind. So I asked my mother, Mother, what shall I eat before final? And she says, Instead of feeding your face, why don't you feed your brain in the classroom? I said, Thank you, Mother, as I proceed to make a potion for the mind. Tomato for lycopy, broccoli for digestion, and my least favorite, garlic for memory. While this potion settles, Let's go to Professor Golenberg and see if we can combine fruits and vegetables for, if you will, a frankenfruit. <laughs> I'm here at the Plant Genetics Lab at Wayne State University with Professor Golenberg. And he's going to explain to us if we can genetically engineer plants. Well, Tony, we can do crosses between different organisms that are sort of related. And one way of doing that is to isolate a gene and then put it into a vector. These vectors are pieces of DNA that can replicate themselves. And once they get into the agrobacterium, that then infects the plant. The genes are actually inserted into the genome, and then we can reproduce those changed cells into full plants that will produce the products that we like. For example, the Macintosh apple is the result of a single mutation in a single plant in Mr. Macintosh's orchard. So could you do a tomato and a watermelon? That might be a little bit difficult. If you could, what would you call it? Waterado or a melon? I mean, what would you call that? 
<laughs> it's glorious. <laughs> to find the right potion for your future, you should check out what else Wayne State has to offer. It is uh, my great privilege in, in closing out the final presenter uh, this afternoon to introduce Dr. Bill Harris. Dr. Harris is a professor of English, is a poet, playwright, prose writer, critic. He wrote a book called Yardbird Suite, Side One. And uh, it was recognized with the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award. And recently, just recently, Dr. Harris was recognized as the 2011 Kresge Foundation Eminent Artist for his many contributions over the years to Detroit's literary landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, from our Department of English, Dr. Bill Harris. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm not really a doctor. I just play one in the classroom. Um, when I was asked, been, thank you for the invitation and to be a part of this day and a part of this marvelous company and um, to President Gilmore Godspeed and all of that. I, I'm just struck again by what a place Wayne is. I was a student here for many, 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 many years. And when I left, I never thought that I would be back this way. And I went around the world, and somehow I ended up back here as a professor. Um, as I was thinking, when I got the call from Jerry and asked if I would do this, I was thinking about, what, first of all, what, what could work in, in five minutes? And then uh, the whole notion of creativity and freedom came, in part because I just had a play in New York about Charlie Parker. One of the things I want to do is to do in three different genres, poetry and prose and plays, uh, things about Charlie Parker, who was, I think, an acknowledged genius and changed the way of music and, and many things in America. So the book of poems that was mentioned, it was the first part, which deals with his first 20 years. And the play Cool Blues, which just closed in New York, dealt with the last three days of his life. And one of the th things I'm going to do is, is to do a prose section which deals with the other. But the notion of creativity and, and freedom, and there was a question about creativity and, and how it can be sustained in children. One of the ways, it seems to me, is that uh, the best advice for anything is a good example. And uh, if there are those kinds of possibilities in schools, then children understand that creativity is a thing that, that has worth and um, is worth pursuing. It's one of the things that ha happened for me in, as a product of, of Detroit schools. Um, came up with a, a couple of things in one of these I've read previously, both are short, one is five minutes and the other is about a minute. Um, again, working in two genres, this is from a novel that uh, has not been published. It takes place uh, in Alabama on a plantation in 1854. One of the things I wanted to think about was, was slavery and, and how people survived that. And a couple of those ways were um, how you conceive freedom and how you think about freedom and, and, um, and, and creative ways in which to do that. The characters we will see here are Cretia's gal, who is a 12-year-old enslaved house servant, Jube, who is a 13-year-old house servant who is mute and is a gardener, and uh, Cretia, who is Cretia's gal's mother, who is a house servant. Uh, and the child has been publicly beaten for a, really an, an imagined transgression against Miss Esme, who is the mistress of the plantation. This is post-whipping. Cretia's gal remembered once, after a scolding by Ms. Esme, when Jube, whistling to himself, had seen her crying and had shown her. But at first, she thought was how to listen to plants grow. Laying flat against the earth, each of them with an ear to the ground, until he, she shook her head and admitted, 
No, she couldn't hear a thing. And he'd laughed and shook his head, indicating, no, that was not it. What then? And he had pointed at her then and wiped his finger under his eyes and shook his head to show no tears. She had realized that because of his diversion, she not only was no longer crying, but she had forgotten all about her hurt. She smiled at him. He had nodded and put his hand to her lips to stop her from speaking. At that instant, Ms. Esme had shouted for her lazy bones, and Cretia's gal had turned and run for the house. But when she looked back before entering, Jube was gone, disappeared as he could do, leaving not even a silence where he had stood. And there's a break here, it's a big break, but um, she has been sold in the, in the interim. And Jube, the boy, and Cretia, her mother, sit together at night and they're comforting each other. And a candle in the center of the dirt floor, Cretia and Jube sitting cross-legged side by side. We've had it hard, she said from a baby up. She talked on and in the flickering light, but all he could think of was moving through the dark after Cretia's gal and being with her and dreaming about the freedom they would run away to one day, even if they had to move through the darkness with her clinging to him, feeling freedom, just thinking about it. Cretia saying she understood, she understood how he felt could feel how he hurt because she had hurt, just like him, telling him to let it go, let the past be the past, let it fall away like petals from a stem, let it go or it would forever hold him down, telling him to be proud of the way he had learned to walk the dark, be proud of the way he could help flowers grow. She was rubbing his hand and she was crying and he was crying and they were crying together and he was breathing, breathing as if it was his first breath, as if he'd been slapped, had the breath slapped in him. And she was rubbing his hand and he was breathing and his face was wet, but he was not crying anymore. His head hung down almost to his lap and he was breathing, just breathing, not crying, not hurting, his eyes closed, sleepy, and she was rubbing his hand, and he was as tired as he had ever been. He slumped sideways and laid his head in Cretia's lap. Jube slept, dreamed honeysuckles growing out of his chest and dogwood sprouting from his mouth, red, orange, yellow, purple, and pink, and roots growing from his hair, his fingers and toes, and running away faster than his thoughts to connect with roots growing from Cretia's gal. And he thinks her name. And for a flash, Cretia's gal is there. A butterfly glimpse as she, darting from one room to another, smiles like the North Star. It is like the sugary dance of candy on his tongue and he thinks her name, and she hears him in camellias and evergreens, hears him in gladiolas and calla lilies, and answers him in delilahs, answers him in primroses and buttercups. Thank you. One more short one. Again, it's about, for me, freedom and uh, and creativity. This is Earl Garner. It's actually from a photograph. I, I did a series of poems on a series of photographs by Roy De Carava, who was a, a jazz photographer. And Earl Garner, I don't know if you know his music, and if you don't, you should, because it's one of the most, uh, I think, joyous sounds in the world. And he was, as a, he couldn't read music, um, and music was just in him, was just a part of him. Uh, and this is uh, a poem, uh, Earl Garner, Joe Benjamin, in New York, 1956. Had, from the age of three, an orchestra in his fingertips, like having flowers for thoughts, could, on command and with elfin delight, 
pull rabbits, doves, and endless silks from his reverie's sleeve, could conjure the pomp and romp of a circus parade. In his left hand, the rumble and stride of the pachyderms trudge behind tamers of lions and throwers of knives and walkers on stilts, high wire, and rope. And in his right, more of the ringmaster's array, showgirls in net holes and fabulous feathers, high flyers, bareback riders, the band, teetering jugglers on single wheel cycles and a jumbling, bumbling babble of clowns tumbling and stumbling from a bantam sedan. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, now, time to turn it back over to our symposium masters, Jerry Heron, Bob Sokol, and Seymour Wolfson. Just a quick comment uh, on the theater piece. I think that much of what we do, teaching is about futures. It's like playing. Seldom have a chance. That's what happens when the teacher I think this is a wonderful, again, wonderful experience, and uh, let's give us a hand to all of our speakers who did a wonderful job today. <laughs> and I'm, I'm truly overwhelmed with the uh, super amount of creativity in this university and what's going on in all of our departments. And again, this is, again, just a small tip of the iceberg of what's going on at Wayne State University. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and participating in this. And uh, as the third of the three tenors, I want to thank you all. Uh, again, it's a great thing to celebrate fellowship in the company of teachers and students. It's what we do, and I think it's never better illustrated than with the beautiful things we had here this morning. And thank you all for being our audience, and thank you all for being our presenters, and thank you, President, President Gilmore, for inviting the symposium this morning. Again, thank you all for taking part in this great celebration of our university's faculty, and we hope to see you at the official inaugural ceremony taking place at 3 o'clock in the Community Arts Auditorium. Thank you so much. <laughs>